So uh, when, when I say I see somebody new, chances are they've been around here longer than I have. But uh, I, I'm glad that we can all be here together today. And I want to thank everyone for uh, deciding to worship with us today. Is Karen Seymour here today? No. Okay. Uh, a friend of hers, a friend of mine, uh, Darlene Huckabay in Michigan, wanted me to tell her hello. So uh, possibly she'll be watching online uh, now or later, and, and we'll get that greeting. I want to invite everybody to uh, come back this evening for our Vesper service, where we will be studying the power of grace and how it transforms our lives. And uh, that'll be at 7 o'clock. And then if we want to go out and get a bite or something, I'm totally open to that. Uh, enjoy relaxing and chilling with my brothers and sisters at the end of a long week. So anybody that wants to join me is more than welcome. Marcy joined me last time. And uh, a couple brothers and sisters from the Homeless Passive Church joined us. We had a great time, didn't we? Yes, yes. All right. Um, October 22, uh, we'll be having a special Sabbath. Uh, we're going to be celebrating our Adventist heritage, uh, especially since uh, October 22, uh, which we remember October 22, 1844. Uh, many people remember it as the Great Disappointment. I remember it as when Christ entered the sanctuary to uh, be our... Uh, our interceder, our, uh, our savior, yes, and of course he's always been interceding for us, but uh, we want to celebrate that, celebrate some other things that were discovered in God's word around that time, and so that Friday night, uh, October 21, we'll have a special Vespers, I'll be speaking on Revelation 10, and then we'll have a, uh, a sermon Sabbath morning, the 22nd, on uh, the things that were discovered uh, during the course of those events. And then we'll have a, a luncheon, and then in the afternoon, we will show the movie Go Tell the World, which I don't know if you've seen it or not. It is a very good movie, well put together on the beginning of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. So I, I hope it will be a... Uh, a good Sabbath for everybody, and I hope everybody can join us. We'll be looking forward to that on October the 22nd. And we're also inviting our uh, friends from Homosassa and Bushnell, and of course, anybody else you want to invite is more than welcome. But you are invited. Speaking of invited, several years ago, I was invited to uh, speak at a church uh, for their International Sabbath celebration. And so I was very honored by that, and I went and I spoke, and everybody seemed to really enjoy the service, and then they had their fellowship lunch, and I went through the line, got my food, went over to a table to sit down, and immediately somebody goes, that seat's taken. I'm like, okay, okay, I'll go sit over here. That seat's taken. I'm like, okay. You wouldn't believe it would happen three times. That seat's taken. Never was it, oh, oh, well, let's get a chair for you so you can join us. Or, or well, this seat's taken, but here's a seat over here. No, all I was getting was, that's taken, that's taken, that's taken. My friend's already sitting here. You can't sit here. And, you know, I'm thinking, and I realized that just because I was a guest speaker didn't make me any more special than anybody else. But I'm thinking to myself, if this is how they treat the guest speaker, how do they treat everybody else here? You know, sometimes you just don't feel invited. What really hurts is when we're not invited into people's lives, especially people in our own family. I remember several years ago, uh, Sunday afternoon, I was enjoying a, a relaxing Sunday afternoon. I forget exactly what I was doing, 
but I received a phone call from the mother of an 11-year-old girl that I was doing baptism studies with. And this mother calls me and she goes, my daughter is getting ready to play for her recital and her father has decided not to show up again. Would, would you please be there? And I said, sure. I dropped whatever I was doing. I ran over to the recital and watched her play and the others play and, and applauded and gave all my encouragement. And, and she was happy that I was there. But when your daddy doesn't show up for a recital, I don't think it really does that much good when your pastor or Bible worker does. Because a pastor or Bible worker isn't going to take the place of your daddy. And even though she did so well, I could tell she was hurt. And even though she did so well, there's, there are private wounds that a million public accomplishments will never heal. Because what she wanted was her daddy there that day. But she was uninvited into his life. I don't know David's heart. I know he had a heart after God's heart. But I imagine there were times David had hurts from being uninvited. What do I mean by uninvited? Well, let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 16. The prophet is coming, the prophet Samuel, and he is coming to Jesse's house to anoint a new king. Not only do they not, the other family members, not think that David is going to be crowned or anointed king that day, they don't even think David needs to be at the meeting. I'm thinking, if I'm David's brother, and I'm thinking I might be anointed king that day, I want my brother David to be there to share that with me. Or if I'm Jesse, I want my youngest son to be there when my older son is anointed king. David is totally uninvited to be a part of this very important family meeting. Totally left out. Forget the fact that they don't think he's going to be anointed king. They don't even think he's worthy to be there to see who is anointed king. Totally left out of the family get-together. Just go watch the sheep. That's all you're good for. As a matter of fact, when uh, Samuel looks at the other brothers, and each time God says, no, not this one, not this one. Finally, in verse 11, Samuel says to Jesse, are all the young men here? Then he said, there remains yet the youngest. He's the youngest. Why did he have to throw that in? And there he is keeping the sheep, or other translations will say, but he's out keeping the sheep. And that but means never mind. Exactly, not important, never mind, he's out keeping the sheep. But Samuel said to Jesse, send and bring him, for we will not sit down till he comes here. And, and of course, we know the story. Uh, we, we can read on, verse 12. So he sent and brought him in, in verse 12, 1 Samuel 16. Now he was ruddy with bright eyes and good looking, and the Lord said, arise, anoint him, for this is the one. Verse 13, then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel arose and went to Ramah. 
So here David is chosen by God to be king. But do you think that took away the hurt that his own family didn't think he even needed to be at the meeting? Again, there are private wounds that a million public accomplishments will never heal. And, and this could be that, that hurt, that rejection, that being uninvited might have been why King David reacted the way he did to Nabal in 1 Samuel chapter 25. David and his men are, are fleeing from Saul or avoiding Saul. King Saul. And David, as they are traveling, David sends a couple of his servants to Nabal to ask Nabal for some food. You know, we've been good to you. Can you give us some food? Can you invite us to a dinner? And let's look at the reaction of Nabal in verses 10 and 11 of 1 Samuel 25. Then Nabal answered David's servants and said, Who is David? Ooh, that's got to hurt. I mean, he's already killed Goliath, saved the Israelites. Women have sung his praises. David has slain his tens of thousands. And yet here Nabal is saying, Who's David? Who is David and who is the son of Jesse? There are many servants nowadays who break away each one from his master. So here David is saving his country, asks this man for some food, and instead this man goes, who are you? Are you another one of those runaway slaves? Are you another one of those runaway shepherds, run, runaway servants. Verse 11. Shall I then take my bread and my water and my meat that I have killed for my shears and give it to men when I don't know where they are from? That had to hurt. Again, David is uninvited doing everything he can for his country, doing everything he can for his God. His brothers don't invite him. His father didn't invite him. Now he's asking a, a man for some food so his man, men can do what they need to do. And again, uninvited. Who are you? Are you one of those runaway servants? Should I be giving food to somebody like you? That has to hurt. And I'm sure it brought back all the pain that had already happened to David. The, the rejection of his family now being rejected here. And, and it's more than David can take. As a matter of fact, in verse 22, David says, May God do so and more also to the enemies of David if I leave one male of all who belong to him, Nabal, by the morning light. David's saying, I've had it. I'm ready to kill him and all of his servants before sunrise. I've had all I can take of this. David's ego is hurt. And it's spiraling out of control. Probably had flashbacks when he was uh, there at the battle in 1 Kings 17, 1 Samuel 17, uh, verse 28. Let's take a look at that. David is just innocently finding out what the deal is with Goliath why he's intimidating the Israeli army. And then Eliab, verse 28, 1 Samuel 17, verse 28. Now Eliab, 
his oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men. And Eliab's anger was aroused against David. And he said, why did you come down here? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? You're not even a real shepherd. That's why we just left you with a few sheep. Where are those few sheep we left you with? I know your pride and the insolence of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. So here, Eliab here is just saying, David, you're just so curious. You have to know everything that's going on. Why don't you just mind your own business, take care of those few sheep that we left you with. Now, Nabal is treating him the same way his brothers have been treating him. Basically the same way his father had treated him. You know, his father could have invited him to the meeting with Samuel. They knew only one was going to be uh, selected. Even if David wasn't selected, he could have been there. Jesse didn't think so. Own father didn't bother to invite him. Just take care of those few sheep. That's all we need you for. Now, that ego is spiraling out of control. It's been hurt time and time again, uninvited, uninvited. No respect, no appreciation. Now David's so angry, he's ready to kill. Now, what is God going to do to intervene to keep a catastrophe from happening right here? Because we have two male egos here, Nabal and David, two male egos that are about to explode. God saves the day by bringing in a woman without an ego. Amen. He did this before when Haman's ego was out of control. And he was ready to destroy Mordecai and all of his people. God saved the day there by again sending a woman who had no ego. A woman who would say, if I perish, I perish. And with that humble attitude, she was a hero. And here we have again Abigail, Nabal's wife, is entering this story as a humble hero when two male egos are about to collide and it's about to get ugly. God again saves the day by sending a woman with no ego. Let's take a look at that. In verse 23, let's see what all, what all she does. Verse 23. Now when Abigail saw David, she dismounted quickly from the donkey, fell on her face before David, and bowed down to the ground. Okay, do we see here already how Abigail is treating David differently than Nabal was and differently than his own brothers and father treated him? She sees him immediately. She bows down to him. Verse 24, she fell at his feet and said, On me, Lord, on me, my Lord, on me let this iniquity be. It wasn't her fault. It was Nabal's fault. But she's going to save the day by having absolutely no ego and saying, just blame it on me. That's a peacemaker. Blessed are the peacemakers. For they shall be called the children of God. Sometimes to be a peacemaker, we take the blame for things that are not our fault. She says, on me let this iniquity be. 
Isn't that what Jesus did when he interceded for us? Isn't that what Moses did when he said, if you cannot forgive their iniquity, blot my name out of the book of life? It says Moses was one of the most humble men. Here we have a very humble woman with no ego is going to save the day by saying, I'll take the blame for this. Just as Jesus went to the cross, totally innocent, and said, I'll take the blame for this. Jesus is our peacemaker. And to be peacemakers, we need to have that same attitude. Now let's go to verse 28. Please forgive the trespass of your maidservant. See, she's still taking the blame for this. For the Lord will certainly make for my Lord an enduring house because my Lord fights the battles of the Lord and evil is not found in you throughout your days. Right here, she's acknowledging that David, she's acknowledging that David is a king. As a matter of fact, she goes on here in verse 29 and says, Yet a man has risen to pursue you and seek your life, but the life of my Lord, David, shall be bound in the bundle of the living with the Lord your God and the lives of your enemies. He shall sling out as from the pocket of a sling. So she's telling him, all those who try to attack you, you're just going to throw them away like a pebble out of a sling. I love this woman. I love the words she's using. She's reminding David, I remember you killed Goliath with a slingshot. She's affirming David instead of putting him down. And friends, there's a big difference between affirming people and flattering people. God affirms us, but he never flatters us. But here David is being affirmed. And she's even reminding him, I remember you killing Goliath. I know that story. I remember the women singing, David has slain his tens of thousands. I know who you are. You're not a runaway slave. You are the king of Israel. In verse 30, she says, And it shall come to pass, when the Lord has done for my Lord, according to all the good that he has spoken concerning you, and has appointed you, Ruler over Israel. Again, affirming David. She's taking the blame for things that are not even her fault. And she's affirming David. She set aside her ego. And she makes sure, number one, David is invited and she goes on and she feeds david and all of his men so finally david is invited and that had to help david is not the only one who has been uninvited in luke chapter 2 verse 7 We're familiar with this story. We usually read it at Christmas time, but we can read it now too. Luke chapter 2, verse 7. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the end. Here Jesus is coming to save the world. And the first message to him is, there's no room. 
that seat's taken. That seat's taken. That room's taken. That room's taken. That room's taken. God comes to this earth to save us, and the first message from earth to God is, there's no room. That's taken. That's taken. We don't have room for you. Uninvited. But how does Jesus respond to that? Let's go back to our scripture for this morning. John chapter 14. Verse 1, John 14. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, many dwelling places. Other translations say plenty of room. Jesus is saying to the people who told him, we have no room for you. He's telling them, in my Father's house, I'm preparing a place where we'll have plenty of room. In my Father's house are many mansions, dwelling places, plenty of rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And I love Jesus. I love his attitude. Jesus doesn't say, in my Father's house are plenty of room. I go to prepare a place for everybody except that innkeeper. He didn't have room for me, so I don't have room for him. No, friends. That's not Jesus. Jesus is saying, I have plenty of room for that innkeeper that didn't have room for me. I'm going to make plenty of room. Sometimes I, I, I see things on, on Facebook. People will make comments or memes. Don't cross the ocean for somebody who won't cross the street for you. And I think to myself, boy, am I glad Jesus didn't have that attitude. You know, and, and I, I hear people say, don't do something for somebody that won't do anything for you. Don't go the extra mile for somebody that won't even go 10 feet for you. And I think, I'm glad Jesus didn't think that way. And not only that. But I, I, I think to myself, you know, a, a parent, it's a good thing parents don't think that way. Because I'm sure as parents, you're always doing things for your children that they're not going to do or can't do the same thing for you, right? But you do it because you're the grown-up, right? And friends, there have been times I've had to tell myself, even when I'm in situations where everybody's 20 years older than I am, Although as I get older, there's not too many more of those left. But as I was growing up, I would be in situations where people would be older than me, and yet I would have to treat them better than they treated me. And I would remind myself, I have to do this, number one, because I'm a Christian. I want to be like Jesus. And number two, because in this situation... I'm the grown-up. Sometimes we have to tell ourselves in situations when, you know, somebody we need to cross an ocean to help somebody who won't even cross the street to help us. We need to tell ourselves, that's my job. I'm the grown-up. Right? And more importantly, I want to be like Jesus. I'm not trying to be like everybody around me. I'm trying to be like Jesus. And here Jesus is telling us, telling the people that didn't have room for him, in my father's house, there's plenty of room. And I'm preparing a place for you. You are invited. 
Now, as I mentioned, there's private wounds that a million public accomplishments will never heal. But I have some good news for you. While your public accomplishments will never heal those private wounds, God's love will. Let's go to Psalm 147, verse 3. David, who knew all about rejection, knew all about broken hearts, knew all about those private wounds of being uninvited, that same David says in Psalm 147, verse 3, He, God, heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. Our accomplishments may never get the praise or the recognition that we want from those around us. An 11-year-old girl may never hear her father applaud her as she plays in a piano recital. But God's love can bind up those wounds and heal them. That's why we're told in 1 John 3, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called the children of God. And friends, when I'm tempted to be slighted or I'm tempted to be offended or I'm tempted to feel unloved, I behold, I contemplate, I meditate on, I daydream about the love my Father has for me that I should be called a child of God. And that love heals my wounds. It heals my broken heart. When I know that my father sent his prized son to die for my sins, so that I could have eternal life with him that invited. Friends, you may have some wounds that all your life you've been trying one accomplishment after another, thinking those accomplishments would heal those wounds. I want to encourage you today, God's love alone can heal all wounds. Look to Christ. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon you. Let that love soak in. Meditate on it. Think about it. Daydream about it. You are loved. You are a child of God. You, my friends, are invited. Please stand and turn your hymnals.